Uh, let's start with you, Mindy. You had you were there uh, having to receive all these bills after weeks of negotiations behind closed doors. Had you been briefed at all during that time? And and then what was it like not to be able to read those bills in, in detail? Well, um, Andy, it was a big problem. You know, going from being the chair and knowing exactly what's going on to being, you know, out there a lot with the public and with the media trying to find out what is going on in there was very frustrating. Um, you know, myself um, being the lead minority member on education finance was included, uh, you know, somewhat before, not when they had the cone of silence and not right before we had the special session. So, so we were asking too. And uh, Paul Thiessen, our minority leader, uh, summarized for myself and Representative Mariani, the education policy chair, yeah. uh, the morning when we were already in special session, globally what was in uh, the education bill. That's the first we heard of it. Um, we got the bill late in the afternoon and went over it with the fiscal staff who had written it um, to try to quickly get a handle on what was in it. And then um, it was hours and hours, uh, not too long before we actually voted on it in the middle of the night, that it was posted for the public. There was something that we didn't like in it and they had to work on fixing it. They didn't quite fix it to our satisfaction. But that postponed it even being up online for the public to see. So uh, this is a very important discussion. So you were able to make, uh, to make some changes to the bill? We did uh, get one sentence in that mitigated to a little bit um, our objections to the deleting of the entire section in law on integration. And um, is that what had been wait, in the st stuck into this bill? That was Explain a repealer. That a little bit more. There's Explain a repealer um, in this education bill um, that repealed all the language that has to do um, with integration and the topic of integration and how the money is passed out. Um, and um, now we're talking about racial desegregation, essentially, right? That is Throughout right. Throughout the metro area, mostly. Right, and the funding okay. that goes with it. And yeah. there's a lot more money that goes to Minneapolis, St. Paul. And Duluth, so part of the Republican war on the core cities that involved a lot of things and a lot of bills was oh, getting yes. rid of integration funding, and um, that was uh, that disproportionately goes to those cities because they're the ones that started it, and they partner with a lot of suburban cities. It's not just for them. Uh, my districts partner, two of my districts partner with St. Paul, for instance, and and one with Minneapolis, right. and so um, you know to just repeal that and not fully understand what's going to replace it. The funding continues on, and this doesn't happen until the next biennium, so there's a chance to fix it if we get a chance. But um, but that was uh, astounding, and Representative Carlos Mariani, um, who um, of course is Hispanic and, and is the executive director of the Minnesota Minority Education Partnership, which deals with um, the achievement gap, school yes. funding, uh, equity issues for students of color. Um, He's been a guest many times. Well, he, he was astounded, um, you know, that that could just be in one fell swoop in the repealers. So, and how um, did Dayton let that through? That's what I'd like to know. Well, I'm not sure. You know, that's the problem. People like me who are intimately involved with this were not intimately involved in these discussions. Yeah. And so, yeah. not only could the public not track it, the media couldn't track it. I couldn't track it. I don't know how that happened, and um, I, I'm intent upon finding out, but, you know, we all had to let the governor have some sleep and let the yeah. commissioners have sleep, and and um, and then we need some time so we aren't too overheated when we have these conversations. So you were able to extract that, that uh, repealer sentence? No, not no. actually. The repealer is still in there. There's just some language that says... Uh, the 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 the, um, the money stays there. Nothing changes for the first biennium. In yeah. the next biennium, um, the money has to be repurposed according to a task force that's going to work between now and then. Six appointed by the governor, six appointed by the legislature, half from the Senate leaders and half from the House leaders, and then um, then they will work to figure out uh, what this money should be used for. It, it, the language says um, that. The money should not um, be decreased from any one district or effort. But um, you know, talking with the many 
lawyers on the House floor should doesn't hold up in the court of law. So that was kind of a yeah a little uh, they like a mandate, don't they? Those yeah, courts. Yeah. So uh, so I think we're in trouble here with our commitment to integration. And I wasn't I've, if we'd had a full fledged discussion of that. Um, just like a lot of things in these bills, I think the public would have demanded a different uh, a different answer. Well, let's hear about some of these other things. Um, who, what else should or were you able to look at in detail, if anything, besides education? Education is the only thing I looked at in okay. detail. Um, we had um, bill briefs um, that th the early process worked well, uh, I have to say. It, it fell down because of this rush to end the shutdown. And I wouldn't say it worked well, but it worked better. <laughs> it didn't work well. Um, but um, the, uh, the early process before the shutdown was that the um, Democrats who were shut out of the process would get the bill that the Republican leaders and the um, governor and his people had negotiated, could read it and then offer input to the governor and then the governor would theoretically take this into consideration before um, he signed off on it. Then it would be posted and then... Um, now where do they post to this? I mean, well, it's, it's just, this is for the public, Mike? Yes, yeah, some of the bills were posted online, but there was not very much notice given to the public at all. I think one or, bill, or, or the, some of the legislators, or, or right? for, to legislators for that matter. <laughs> sometimes they were given bills 40 minutes before they actually voted on it. I mean, I went through and tabulated. There were 1,104 pages of bills. Most of those bills were posted within less than 24 hours. I find it very hard to believe that many legislators had the time to go through and read that. I mean, that many pages that would is almost like... 1,104 hours. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's almost as long as War and Peace. <laughs> and so right. imagine that we had some legislators who were expected to read War and Peace in one night. Oh. It didn't happen. And so that concerns me because you have these policy experts that we elect as citizens to be those experts, to understand these nuances, just like Representative Greiling. And if they don't have time to go through and read it, to find those issues, like she just described, then we have a problem because now we have policies, we have statutes in law yeah. that did not get thoroughly vetted. Uh, clearly not. Well, now, so uh, quite a, actually, in this last session, quite a bit of legislation got through without being heard very well, right? Uh, the public didn't hear much about it. The le leadership ra uh, railroaded it through for this last session altogether. Is that right, Mindy? Well, I just I have been um, dissatisfied with the process other years, but this one took the cake um, to, to, oh. <laughs> to, to just blank yeah. out and skip all the members of the minority party. You know, when we had um, negotiations with Governor Pawlenty, we always had uh, Marty Seifert, you know, the minority leader, was always sitting at his elbow. Um, when we had um, meetings on education, uh, Represent Pat Graffalo, who's now the Education Finance Chair, I had him on the conference committee, and we never ever met as just a Democrat group without him, except for once on some very small issue. I told him we were meeting without him, and then we picked him up right away, but he went to dinner with us. This year, there weren't a single member of the um, Democrats on the Education Conference Committee from either the Senate or the House. And um, they didn't see... On the conference committee? On the conference committee. Um, they always go bipartisan, don't they? Well, usually, but they, um, they said we didn't vote for the bill, and that was their excuse for not letting us be involved in the negotiations. We had to promise ahead of time to vote for the bill. Representative Graffalo, who I had um, had at my elbow, I always thought, you know, keep your, your enemies close, try to buy them in when you can. <laughs> uh, he didn't vote for the bill, the uh, education bill, after the conference committee he concluded. He did not vote He did for not. It. He's not the chair of the committee. Well, uh, no, I mean when I was the chair. Oh, I see. Uh, he I was see. on at my elbow when I was oh, the chair. Oh, I see what you're talking about. You're comparing the two. But I then see. he turns yeah. around and um, leaves me out. But I always involved him, and he ranted and raved on the floor. Um, many people have looked at his speech uh, in hindsight because it was so astoundingly negative and um, but yet he had been involved so for him then to say I had to promise to vote for the bill or I couldn't be involved was very unfair and you know turnabout is fair play well but it's I, unrepresentative he, of the public as well uh, exactly since since you are after all on the committee you are uh, a representative of some people 
<laughs> you mean they're they're going to be punished for having elected you in a way, aren't they? That's exactly what happened. You you have to guess. I guess the public has to guess who's going to be in the majority, and then. Um, and only elect uh, them from their district. Good luck, public. <laughs> and newspapers across the state were very critical of this process. Unfortunately, that criticism was maybe a little bit too late to really impact the final outcome. Yeah. But I think the Winona Daily News really said it best when it said, this isn't good government. This isn't even bad government. It's not government. It's not the way things should go in a democracy, regardless of which party is in control. Uh, Rich, were you following tracking this process much? I sure was, and I, I want to make some comments based on what uh, my other colleagues or mm -hmm. guests have said. Go ahead. One of the things is that this happens in both parties. I've been up there for decades, so I've, I've seen many end of sessions. So it's not a Republican, it's not a Demo DFL. I mean, they, Are you disagreeing with Representative Greiling? In, yes, in yes. That? I mean, I've seen it both ways. All I've right. seen when the DFL has been in power. And they've excluded and, and Republicans? And they've excluded um, yep. And I, I look at it from a broad perspective. Uh, you know, I don't know about individual committees, but I see it on both ways. I think what was very unique about this situation is basically the shutdown. I, I, I think one of the things you've got to remember what transparency is, what accountability is, what openness is. At the end of session, you know, before, you know, the, before a special session, things move fast. But people are in the capital. People can feel the vibes. People can talk to people. You can gather, as I call, uh, political shtick, you know, to see when you talk to some of the people you might work with on a bill or some legislation because they'll tell you little things. And then you can go to the chair of a committee or say, hey, what's up here? Or you go to a staff person. So, you know, in a, in, it is transparent in terms of transparency where you can see, you can... And, uh, and this is true when? Well, what I'm trying to say is, you know, during session. I mean, it's, an, it's a transparent, oh, during the session, I see. transparent process. Even but even, even in the check? rush, even in the rush towards the end of session when things do move fast, you have to know the system. I mean, you have to, I mean, there is that crunch in that last five days. And even the rules of the House and Senate that they adopt, both Democrat and Republican over the years, that says that, you know, you can, uh, let's say, you, it's some rules say you have to have th uh, three days for a public hearing. Well, as time goes towards the adjournment, there, it might only be one day, 12 hours. So, I mean, it, you can blame it on both. But the point that I'm trying to say is then, at, when shutdown, when the session passed, a regular special session, the Capitol is usually open. So you, the people can go to the Capitol, and yes. yes, there will be the discussions behind closed doors, but by being in the Capitol, yes. you could have a sense of what's happening, ask questions, at least have some kind of transparency to see who talks to who or what or whatever. Now, are they e even though you're not necessarily privy to the details? Well, you can get the, you eventually you can get the details if you. I, I, that's one of the things of persistency and all that, and that's happened for decades at the legislature. But what really did the kicker was when they shut down for 19 days, and that the public was not able at all to go into that building. To feel those vibes, to see who was what. Now see the that people. was true of the Capitol. Was it also true of the state office? State building? office building. All right. It uh -huh. can even uh, which is where the house is located. Right. I mean, I yeah. mean, I, I think that's one of the. I, I'm just trying to say. Yeah. That it, it's, both parties have always done it for years. My decades being at the legislature, I've seen it. But what was very unique was the shutdown.